So the role of the two hormones, GLP-1 and GIP, is traditionally thought of as regulating insulin secretion. And uh, that has been looked at mainly by infusions of the hormones and measurements of insulin secretion afterwards. But today there's a new development. Uh, so what has happened is that there's now a GIP antagonist available for human studies. And it's been possible to study this uh, in humans uh, to block the GIP part of it, but also you can at the same time block the GLP-1 part with what is called Exendin-9, which is an antagonist of the GLP-1 receptor. And you can use both of them to see what it really matters for glucose metabolism. And sure enough, if you combine those two antagonists, there is a clear effect on glucose, that is glucose rises, because uh, the, their effect is to keep it down. But then it turns out that GIP is actually the most immediately important uh, insulinotropic hormone, at least the one that has the greatest effect on insulin secretion and glucose regulation. One of the reasons behind this is that the antagonist for GLP-1 is a little bit of a complex thing, and that is because it interferes strongly with glucagon secretion, so that you have an increase when you apply the antagonist, and that increase also results in effects on glucose. So the picture is a little bit difficult, but to sum up, you know, um, it seems that the effect of GIP is now clear and established, and it is an important increase in hormone. So the GLP-1 agonists have been used now for quite a while. They were introduced in 2006, and um, and uh, it is clear that that one of the problems is the gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, it has been known for many years now that if you have uh, too high uh, rates of administration, one way or the other, you will have the gastrointestinal side effects with nausea, eventually vomiting, and diarrhea perhaps. So that has been the limiting factor. But it turns out that if you uh, do a careful uptitration of them, uh, it seems right now that there's almost no upper end uh, that you can really use much higher doses that have been anticipated before. And this is certainly true for, for GLP-1 uh, agonists from both the liraglutide arm or semaglutide arm and, and also for dulaglutide. So right now uh, we are seeing much higher doses being used experimentally so far, but I'm pretty sure that they will be there uh, in the future. And um, that means that we may be able to see effects that are almost unexpected. Uh, very large effects on body weight and perhaps even stronger effects on A1C levels. So yes, it seems that the problem has been circumvented somehow, to some extent. So one of the new exciting things, of course, is combination therapies. Uh, and that is another way of amplifying these effects. And uh, so it's, it's interesting, of course, to combine GLP-1 with GIP and see what happens. Traditionally, we thought of GIP as being ineffective in type 2 diabetes. And there's a, we a, a wealth of information about this in the literature, and, and, and we've certainly contributed a lot to it. But now a, a new compound, tercepatide from Eli Lilly, has been introduced, not available yet, but the phase 2 studies have been shown. And uh, apparently this co-agonist has a very, very powerful effect on both glucose regulation and appetite and therefore weight loss. Uh, so is that now because uh, of an unexpected effect of GIP? And we have been trying to understand this and we've been using combinations of GLP-1 and native GIP to try to understand what happens. And so far, all that we've seen, particularly in type 2 diabetic patients, when we add in the GIP is that the few good things that, that, that might happen, that is the, um, the inhibition, for instance, of glucagon secretion that you see with GLP-1 can be obliterated with GIP, it goes away. And if you look at the appetite inhibiting action of GLP-1 that you can show clearly, if you then add GIP on top, that might go away to some extent. So uh, experimentally, there is absolutely no support in humans for a potentiating or, 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 or amplifying effect by adding in GIP. But we'll have to see because um, this tercepatide out there uh, is really promising. It could be a super GLP-1 agonist. That's my best take on this at the t time being.
In our own studies, uh, what we have done is to combine GIP and GLP-1 infusions and look at what happens in type 2 diabetic individuals. And we've been using somewhat larger doses to understand a little bit better what goes on here. So um, it, it seems in our hands that when you add in GIP, the good effects we have of GLP-1 are actually uh, prevented or, or inhibited. So for instance, um, the inhibition of appetite and therefore food intake with GLP-1 can actually be blocked by adding in GIP. And also the inhibition of glucagon secretion can also be um, blocked or flattened out if you add in GIP. So in our hands, there's no good effect of adding in GIP at all to this combination. But uh, we do have the results of the tercepatite and they're very, very interesting and powerful. So maybe that's something we don't know yet. And um, so we'll have to see simply, we'll have to work more with this new compound and see what happens. The use of the antagonist, GIP antagonist, is as new as I said. And um, that opens for a, the possibility to investigate other effects of GIP. And so one of the very powerful effects of GIP in our hands again is its effects on bone resorption. So we're trying to look at GIP as a regulator of bone and trying to see if that could be exploited in clinical therapy of bone disorders. And that seems probable at the time being. So this is definitely one of the important fields. Another field is GIP's role in lipid deposition. So it seems from a lot of experimental studies, again, that GIP plays a role in lipid deposition after a meal. And that's why we are probing this with the GIP receptor antagonist to try to see if we can reduce that lipid deposition. And it turns out that there may even be an inhibitory effect on, of the antagonist on um, lipid absorption and postprandial lipid levels. So this is a new, very exciting field that we're looking into and where some of the human studies uh, look promising, I have to say. So there are, I think it was 10 large clinical studies being presented. And uh, the one that I'm personally most excited about is the Rewind study. Uh, because uh, these uh, cardiovascular effects of the GLP-1 agonist that we have seen uh, in people with established cardiovascular disease, they seem to be translatable even into people without established cardiovascular disease, and therefore they may have a fantastic preventive role. Uh, so that study, uh, the Rewind study, is what I'm really looking forward to. But otherwise, all the good news is in the posters. So it's just, you know, lift your feet and go to the poster session. That's, that's where things really happen.